welcome everyone this afternoon to our webinar on intragroup services in Malaysia. Now, why do we come up with this webinar and this topic? I think intragroup services is one of the most challenging transactions in Malaysia and in the region. We'll present some cases today that explain some of the challenges that are presented to taxpayers when it comes to intra-group services. So we're very excited about talking to talk about this topic today. Um, before we get into the detail, let us just do a brief introduction about our firm for those who are new. Um, during the at the end of the webinar, we will have as usual a, a, a opportunity to write uh, or answer questions. So feel free to use the Q and A button for this purpose. So, our firm, for those of you who are new, we specialize in advising multinational companies in the area of transfer pricing and international tax. We have. Now, four offices, uh, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, and UAE, given that there is a new legislation that has entered into place in UAE, and therefore we're also um, offering our services in this market. And soon we also going to be having transfer pricing solutions in Indonesia. So uh, lots, 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 lots happening. In the transfer pricing space, we also contribute um, frequently to journals and we have won several awards just for information here. Let me just um, introduce our speaker, which is Hon Chuan Tan, which is our director and leader, a technical lead in Malaysia with over 10 years of experience advising multinational companies and local companies in Malaysia in the area of transfer pricing. Apart from that, he has also played a key role in developing our transfer pricing practice in Malaysia. And we're lucky to have him now more than four, five years and after working in a, one of the leading mid-tier firms in Malaysia. For those who don't know me, my name is Adriana Calderon. I'm the co-founder and director and technical lead for Asia, co-founder of Transfer Pricing Solutions Asia and Malaysia with more than 15 years of experience in advising multinational companies and companies in the area of international tax and transfer pricing. So with that, let's just go into the detail for today so we can go through the topic that we are going to share with everyone. So we will be covering two key aspects. First, explaining some key concepts around intragroup services and why the intragroup services is relevant. And two, how do we approach uh, any analysis of transfer pricing in Malaysia regarding intragroup services. So I guess one of the big questions that we always have, and I guess Hon Chuan, you can just elaborate on these, is understanding like what is the rationale behind intragroup services? And I'm gonna put a spin here, which I get asked a lot and probably you do, is okay, so, why do I need to have an intragroup service? Why shouldn't I just pull any cost that are shared and then just share the cost among the entities of the group? Why do I have to go through the trouble of having something called intragroup service? All right. So is that a, a kick off questions that we have? So I think that's a very, very much asked question every time that we deal with clients and and I would love to have this um you know webinars refreshed every time in triple services because it has been an increased amount of queries that we have both from you know the clients um, as well as the um tax authorities as well right so the question is you know why are we having Intragroup services instead of you know, sharing costs and then take it according to entities within the group, right? But first up, we need to look at you know what are the type of services are we talking about here? 
that what are the range of services that a group may have um, within the group so that you know they can identify these services beforehand. Right. So we have services that includes you know your, your normal administrative services, technical, financial marketing, uh, management. Okay, management here may mean different things, right? We have strategic management as well as you know, the term used management that could be that could mean you know compiling all all the services into one, as well as you know contract R and D. Now contract R and D is a very interesting one where in Malaysia there are more and more startup companies that are actually providing contract R and D services. And it is increasingly important that they need to identify these services, this service beforehand to understand what it entails. Now, the question is, why? Why do I have to charge all these intergroup services? The, the, the main reason when I think of you know, having a group um, to centralize um, any services or incentivize a group to have a service entity in place is that you know when you centralize um, services into one entity, in particular in an entity where the jurisdictions have particular advantage to provide um, service in particular cost advantage, for example, like Malaysia, then you know when you centralize that service, it is both cost effective and actually actually efficient for the group as well to actually centralize a pool of talent that would be able to provide that service to the group as a whole. Now then it makes sense then when you have these service providers in place in a particular entity, then it makes sense to actually charge for these services to properly remunerate these entities by way of having you know, benefits received from these services, right? So. The main point when we look at charter pricing is that, you know, are we looking at services or are we looking at something else? What entails a service? What, what does the service mean, right? So in terms of doing that, we have to go through a, a set of process to actually ensure that we have that service in place. What's your take in that, um, Adriana, in terms of, you know, why, why do we need to charge for services? Why, why can't we just pull everything in? and one and then distribute the cost. Yeah, I think you have um, you have a point that um, there is a benefit that one gets from sharing cost uh, or uh, obtaining a, an activity being done by another company somewhere else. Now, I think the reason why we don't just put costs and that's it is also associated with the fact that in transfer pricing, we need to simulate what one will do in a third party scenario. So the question is, would someone share me some resources at any cost or just at cost without making a profit out of it? And I think the answer to that is no. Because in a third party, if we talk about third party behavior, the possibility of sharing or, outs or allowing someone to outsource something to me comes from the premises that you are going to make a profit out of that business. So I think if you just share cost, you are not really simulating what a third party behavior is. I think the other aspect is also, especially when it comes to employees, if I'm obtaining a benefit out of an entity who is employing a team, that entity is taking the risk of employing because employing people comes with a risk. And I think it wouldn't be fair for that entity to bear that risk without having a proper profit compensation. So you will be getting the downside, which is the risk of employment, of employing people, that, but you wouldn't be getting the upside, which is making some profit out of it. So those are also some, some reasons I see as to why that's the way 
services need to be structured basically or why is a service and not just a share of cost? So maybe that I would pass it on to you back just yeah. to through summarizing what will be the key aspects when it comes to services and what one needs to look into. Yeah, yeah. So as Adria has clearly you know worded as that when you think about transfer pricing, really we will always need to think about what would an independent party will do, whether they are um in a similar circumstances where I mean they provide such service, what kind of remuneration are they expecting, right? In terms of that particular transaction. Now, when we look at setting up a service transaction, right? There are several key aspects that you need to look at. First is to, you know, whether to identify the service transaction and also to determine whether this transaction actually is defined as a service or not, right? The first step always is to look at whether services are actually rendered by any of the group entities. You know, the first thing that you need to do is we call it benefit test, right? By looking at when you provide such activity, does it benefit the recipient? And what benefit does the recipient receive from the activity that you provide, right? When you have gone through this benefit test and that if the recipient does receive any benefit, then you can then sort of define that as a service, that particular activity as a service prov provision, right? Once they've gone through that process, the next step is to look at, you know, the cost base of that service. You know, we'll be looking at um, what are the costs that is attributable to the service performed to the particular recipient. Then after you have correctly identified the cost base, then you pull up with a markup supported by a benchmarking. So this markup is where, where I explained earlier, an independent, part, independent party would not be doing a charity work where they provide a service at cost, without you know a way of remunerating on the profit level right so a markup will need to be then supported by benchmarking and unfortunately in malaysia we currently do not have a safe harbor ruling so hence we have included that supported by benchmarking element there and then once the cost base um, and the markup are identified then it should then be formalized into a contract we, we have been emphasizing on having a contract in place uh, on top of the transfer pricing policy as well as key documentation where a contract should properly um, explain and document it in relation to the service provided, the cost base, as well as, as, well as the markup imposed on that service to then formalize it into the contract and to go along with the transfer pricing documentation, which is next step, which is TP analysis, where, where that's where TP documentation is prepared. Now, this TP analysis will then actually test what you have um, identified and prepared and implemented into your system in relation to this service provision to, to analyze whether you know, the, the costs and markup are properly documented and then properly tested to see whether they are actually at arm's length and satisfy the arm's length principle of the transfer pricing rules and regulations. Thank you, Hong Chan. So then the question, when you talk about benefit test and whether there are services that's really happened, it brings the question, so we talk about why a service does exist. Now, that brings one key question, which is, can a company charge for everything? Does every single activity that an intra-group, a, a multinational group does that is shared, can it be always charged? Can it always be considered a service? Or are there any parameters in place to say, well, there is a limit also of to how much I can charge? Yeah, so that begs the next question, right? 
you know, what are the activities that I can charge? What activities that I cannot charge, right? We will first need to look at, you know, the non-chargeable activities, which are, you know, split into four. The first one is shareholder activities. Now, shareholder means that, you know, as the owner of an entity, what are the non-chargeable activities that should not be charged? A great example would be a preparation of a consolidated statement. Now, this consolidation of statements, financial statements, are purely the responsibility of a holding company, right? That's, that's their obligation to ensure that they need this um, consolidated statements prepared and then to provide it. Now, these are not the responsibilities of the subsidiaries. Right. So therein lies that you know when you have an entity that are purely responsible of another entity, then these are perceived as non-chargeable activities. And then the second one, duplicate activities, you know, obviously you when you have duplication of activities, then by right, you shouldn't be charging both activities at the same time. Now, obviously, there are certain except exceptions that we can go through later. And then the third one is services with incidental benefits, passive association benefits. Incidental benefit means that when you have, when the recipient obtain certain benefits incidentally, not because of a objective point of view, but just because, for example, you're part, being part of a group that you have obtained certain benefits. One a good example is that when a subsidiary happened to borrow um, a loan from the bank, right? Just because they're part of a bigger group that the bank may have you know, provided a loan at a lower interest rate. Now, this can be called as incidental, incidental benefit. But in contrast, if the parent entity actually provided a guarantee to the bank, in relation to the borrowings from the subsidiaries, then that's not really called an incidental because the, the, par the parent entity actively provided a guarantee to obtain a lower interest for the subsidiary. So when that happens, then generally a guarantee fee should be charged back to the, the subsidiary for provision of that particular service. Lastly, we have on-call services. Now, on-call services is a bit tricky, but um, in essence, we are looking at you know whether an on-call service is a twenty-four-seven um, service to be provided ad hoc on an ad hoc basis to the subsidiaries or holding company. For example, you have your financial, managerial, any technical or legal issue. Now, what the IRB states that these on-call services are not chargeable mainly because they are easily and promptly available from, let's say, from a third party without any, without the need of having a standby arrangement, right? So the potential for this service is actually quite remote to have a 24-7 on-call service for um, state services and that the benefits derived from state services are actually negligible, right? Obviously, there are certain exceptions to on-call services, and we'll need to really look at whether these on-call services actually are chargeable or non-chargeable. Chargeable. But essentially, we are in the view that having a contract in place that may be centralized or specific and maybe not on-call is essential. So we need to then identify these non-chargeable services Thank you, Honchun. So that brings us to the point of, okay, then if I cannot charge for those activities, what can I charge for? Yeah, they have the title, you know, clearly stated may, may be chargeable because it is really crucial to really assess the activities that actually performed before determining whether they are chargeable or not. Right, it may seem chargeable in your eyes, but upon further detail, it may not be chargeable. So now let's go through what may be chargeable. Um, straightforward ones are, you know, when there are specific benefits um, rendered for a 
particular service we're seeking. Outside of the non-chargeable activities I've, I've explained earlier, for example, we have your, um, including a second line, centralized services, um, shared service, providing services that benefit the group, for example, right? These are, you know, we have your direct charges as well as your centralized when it's split into different services, um, entities within the group as well. And then thirdly, we have ancillary. Now, ancillary or another term you can use is subsidiary services where these services are rendered in line with another transaction. For example, a transfer of property or a, an intangible where you really need to have a service in place in line with the transfer of properties, then these are chargeable. But you really need to then um, accurately separate the transfer of property part as well as the provision of services in relation to the transfer of property, right? Clearly separated so that you can be clearly distinguish the proper remuneration for the transfer of properties as well as the remuneration for the services provided in relation to this uh, transfer of property. Now, as I explained earlier, we also have exceptions um, that can be chargeable. One example is for on call for you know for on call services. Whether again we we'll go back to the principles where would a an independent party be willing to pay for this on call service ad hoc charges to be on standby, right? Some a great example for this is in particular is the IT system when we have a existing existing system in place, especially during a stage of implementation, your ERP system, where any risk of having it have any downtime in place may be detrimental to the business operation. Hence, more or less, you would have a agreement in place with the service provider and service recipient to have a 99% uptime, for example, of a server or web hosting of that server to ensure that the IT system is more or less um, almost 100% uptime. Hence, you are paying for a 100% uptime. And if there are any issues that does not satisfy that 99% uptime, then obviously the service provider will be liable. So these are some of the examples where independent party would be willing to pay for that for an hundred percent uptime of the system itself. Then lastly, we have you know exceptions for uh, duplication services, where it should be deemed as temporary and not ongoing, and it relates to whether having this service, for example, a, um, of having a different opinion, right? So you have the same service, but then you, you want to ensure that you want to have a separate opinion to ensure that it will, it will not make a wrong business decision. Any wrong business decision will be detrimental to the business operation. And that with this duplicated service, that you will ensure that the any decision make, any informed decision make would be a more or less not the wrong one. May not be a correct one, but not the wrong one. Right, these are the exceptions that, that may be chargeable of services. Okay, thank you, Hong Chun. So I guess to summarize what we're saying is there are certain activities that are non-chargeable. We already say which ones are not. There are other activities that may be chargeable. Now, the question is, what is the key aspect to say that it is in fact chargeable? What is it that I have to prove as a taxpayer? I think I've meant, I wanted to mention on, especially the on-call services where on top of, you know, going through the benefits, but you need to have um, an agreement in place, especially on for on-call to ensure that it, you have satisfied the first step, which is to formalize it in the contract and ensure that it's chargeable. On top of that, 
you need to look at you know all these key factors for the benefit test that which is the first step that you need to face the benefit needs to have an economic or commercial value now it's very important that we don't just document that hey um the service provider has provided an IT service and the service provision because I've received the IT services, we benefit from this service, this IT service without objectively providing what has the service recipient benefited from. Now you really need to then explain and provide substantiation why it has benefited, for example, and enhancing a recipient's return. Right, it is a clear benefit that a service recipient would have when we are able to prove that we have increased in revenue, mm -hmm. right, right after obtaining the service. Right. Then the other way to look at it is reduction in cost. Right. When you have re reduced cost, means you have efficiency in businesses, means obviously increase in income. Right. And example of it would be you know when when we have provided we are receiving this service and that service helped your business operations to decrease your processing time, decrease production time, right? That is the clear benefit. And then again, we'll go back to the independent party where obviously an independent party will be willing to pay for it when they themselves will know that they will objectively benefit from state services being provided, right? So this, these are the main three areas where you really need to objective, objectively provide um, evidence that you have clearly the recipient has clearly obtained a benefit from that service. Yeah, so I guess that's one of the, the biggest challenges, right? To objectively find a way, and we will see it in the case studies, how difficult it can be and why a lot of the times um, taxpayers get challenged on the benefit side which sometimes is not looked at it in detail. And that comes back to, you know, focusing a lot on the markup. And it is important to understand what's the approach on the markup, but it's not the only consideration when it comes to a service charge, right? So maybe you can explain to us in general how one will go about setting up the markup then. Yeah, hence we put it at the last rate. I mean, obviously markups are equally important but they're over-focused where you know, everyone just look, look at the markup and when I get a right markup, I'm fine. But then that may not be the case. But then when we look at markup, now the approach on identifying the appropriate arm's length markup is to look at what are the activities uh, that are being provided. If we look at the pyramid here, clearly, um, we, it, service, services are distinguished between low value adding services and value adding services. Now, low value adding services generally would, would have a lower return, right? Because of it not being um, linked to revenue generating activities. So, low value adding services can, can be your human resources, accounting, IT support. Um, administrative type services and then we have marketing services and technical services as the value adding services um, where they should be remunerated higher than the low value adding service because they are more more on the value generating uh, activities that could actually help the business operations so when you look at it so it Okay, here it doesn't mean that marketing services may earn less than technical services nowadays. Um, you know, economy is, are changing. Um, the world is changing, where marketing services may may be above technical services. But for the sake of this diagram, we are just um separating the low value services against marketing and technical services, where higher risk will, should mean higher return. And that you know value adding should be generated higher than a low value adding one. Yeah, so that's essentially the way to to go about it. But I guess we have to come back to the fact that 
we want to go through a couple of two or three case studies and then some of the um, examples of how this has been a study in court case, mainly because I guess there are quite a few challenges. I think it's more from an operational point of view more than anything else when it comes to setting a service charge. A lot of questions come up when it comes to implementation more than, okay, yes, yeah, the service charge is total cost plus a markup, but there is always a lot of questions that get asked and hopefully through the case studies, we can answer some of them, but just, I guess six key or five key things to consider. One is that I think almost every multinational group has gone through a review or an audit that involves services. So it is a transaction that they get picks up a lot in the region um, because everyone is well, like all tax authorities are well versed, but also because there is a lot of, I will say disparity in the way one approach uh, concepts like what is chargeable versus what is not chargeable. I think the other issue is that the evidence test, test to, tends to be very, very subjective as well, as we will show it in, in the following slides. And then, there will also be a lot of questions about, okay, what do I include in the cost? How far do I go particularly with indirect cost of performing the, the activity? And then obviously we may have issues around uh, inappropriate markups being selected or discrepancies in what is set up in the contract versus what is being implemented in, in the company, you have a, a lot of experience with this, right? With going through detailed review with tax authority on not only looking at the TP report, but also looking at the detail on how the whole transaction was implemented, right? And maybe you can share some in the case studies. And then obviously we have the issue of share entities with loss making situations and that being challenged by, by the tax authority. So maybe let's just go through case one first and you, you maybe you can elaborate on some of your experience with this. So we have an, a scenario where one has a regional HQ that obtains uh, services from, or the other way around, pay, gets paid services from subsidiaries, company C and company D located in, Malaysia and Indonesia as um, a total cost plus a markup. So this is the typical example in the region. The regional happens to be a lot of the times in Hong Kong or in Singapore or nowadays even UAE. <clears throat> and you get charged some services from head office, which happens to be or supposed to be shared. So there are three key things here which it would be great if you could share your your some light on it, which is first, what are some of the challenges associated with explaining the benefit to the subsidiaries uh, and spe specifically in the tax authorities countries such as Malaysia and Indonesia? Yeah, yeah. Um, in relation to business benefits, it's it's really tough to objectively provide um, quantitative um, data to explain business benefits to the tax authorities. But the first thing, the first key thing that we need to do is first go through what are the services being provided by the regional HQ. And after identifying these services, then to explain to subsidiaries why these services are important why, why is it critical to the subsidiary business in order for them to be successful, not just for the group, but for the local entity as well? So you need to then provide these benefits that would be um, essential for the group as well. And on top of that, we really need to then, in the contract itself between um, Malaysia and Indonesia to the regional HQ to ensure that you know what are the services uh, being provided by HQ, what are the costs and what are the markups in place 
to be properly documented into the contract itself. Really, we really need to look at um, in terms of having pre um, service provision versus post provision, provision and what are the improvement for the entity, right? The same thing will apply to explaining these benefits to the tax authorities, whereby we are trying to say that as a subsidiary, in order to improve, in order to uh, be successful, that the subsidiary has, you know, requested requested for um, certain activities from the regional HQ to be benefited and then to actually help the subsidiary's business. This this will help, you know, provide the tax authorities to to further explain that it's not it's not really forced upon by the regional HQ to say that hey you need these services from me, right? If not, you're, gonna, you're not going to survive, right? It's more so that it, it is a interactive between the, the subsidiaries and the regional HQ to have a discussion or meeting to ensure that, hey, what, what, what do we need to improve or to be competitively, to provide competitive advantage in as compared to their competitors, right? As a regional HQ here, right? What, what activities can I benefit from the region HQ to actually um, be more competitive than my um, competitors within the respective jurisdiction, right? So this is how you should then properly document into the TV documentation to ensure to actually explain to the tax authorities that, hey, this is what they've done. They've gone through this process and that we really need the benefit to actually compete to actually be successful so that the tax authority then will see that, hey, yeah, so these are the services that, that could actually benefit the subsidiaries as a whole. That's a really good point, especially the one around not being an imposition, more than yeah. being a necessity from subsidiary point of view. And I guess that brings us to the third question, which is, okay, once I sort out that there is a commercial benefit for the recipient, which in this case is company C and company D, then the question is how, I'm going to set up the methodology here because I have a situation of a regional HQ providing services to maybe more than one subsidiary. So how one will uh, go at looking at, at that methodology? Yeah, I think now, nowadays, I think I was looking at the, you know, nowadays we are more so inclined to having services being provided remotely and benefit test issue we have um, that I've explained earlier where you actually explain it similarly, explaining in the TP, TP documentation that, you know, even though services are provided remotely, but then the benefit is clearly um, identified so that the tax authorities will be able to actually um, address this benefit test issue. And thirdly, we are looking at regional HQ providing um, services to um, different entities. And when a service is actually not provided directly to the entities in, in question, Malaysia and Indonesia, then really we need to look at how to allocate this cost um, by way of using the indirect method um, to appropriately allocate um, these costs based on activity, activities performed for the respective regions, right? First, um, we have to go through a benefit test. After that, we have to go through the cost base, which is the second step. And to identify all this cost base, generally you have cost centers in relation to the services provided, right? Be it to Malaysia or Indonesia, you have a cost pool in place that you will calculate the total cost base for this particular service to be allocated to Malaysia and Indonesia. And then once you have identified that cost base, the next step is look at, depending on what services are being provided to the respective entity. Um, we've got an example here, type of allocation. If you actually provide any services, then you, know, you have time spent. Or if you're providing HR services, if you headcount, IT services, number of P, um, PC or number of user IDs, for example. So the, the rule, or the rule of thumb here is that the 
allocation key needs to be selected by way of ensuring that it relates to the benefit received by the service recipient, right? So we will need proper justification as well. You can't just simply uh, use the allocation key and treat it as though, okay, fine, I'm gonna use this for my X service, that's fine. But you actually need to justify why you have selected that allocation and why you have deemed that allocation as the most appropriate allocation key to be used to be to actually allocate these costs to Malaysia and Indonesia. Right. So that, that's how you should work around the indirect method. Yeah, and I think one key thing here is basically whatever allocation key that you choose, you need to justify the objectivity of and to quantify that benefit. So it has to be objective and it also has to be consistent. So in our experience, a lot of companies spend a lot of time in this operational aspect, trying to define what's the cost base and what is going to be the allocation methodology because it needs to be implemented consistently from one year to the other and needs to be objective. So let's look at case two, which is uh, a different scenario whereby we have a shared service center that serves as a cost center to an entrepreneur. So we, this entrepreneur can be located a lot of the times in Singapore or in Australia or in Hong Kong. And it has a company that provides shared services in Malaysia. So the question is, what is the importance, or in your opinion, in your experience, what's the importance of the characterization? What's the importance of having the contracts? And how do I have to manage the markups? And I guess the cost to some extent as well, the cost base. But how is this case different to the first one, basically? So in Malaysia's context, obviously now Malaysia is providing service. Um, the first thing is, the more important thing is actually characterizing um, what Malaysia, the Malaysia entity does um, the, and what entails and what the basis for characterizing Malaysia as a service provider, right? Very, very critical because when you have this in place, when you have characterized it, if you have characterized it wrongly, you know, the IRB has the power to actually re-characterize your transaction into something else, which means that you know, it may be higher than what you have, you have charged, for example, and then you have um, penalties and adjustments. So when you perform a characterization, you have to ensure that the function analysis perform as that the risks are properly documented to ensure that the Malaysian entity are properly characterized and properly remunerated. Right. So when you have the characterization in place, the, the rule of thumb is that it needs to be properly remunerated based on the characterization, be it limited risks, be it routine, be it a, 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 maybe a full-fledged service provider. Right. So every stage of characterization would have um, different markup in place. Right. They will be remunerated differently. So you have to make sure that characterization is um, done and documented correctly. And then secondly, once you have correctly characterized, you would have to formalize the contract again, what services are being provided, and also allocation of risks between your entrepreneur versus your uh, entity in Malaysia, who are the ones bearing more risks, right? So the contract should properly delineate all this um, uh, information into the contract itself to ensure that you, what you have properly, what you have actually described in the contract is reflects in substance what you are providing to to the entrepreneur or to the holding company and then thirdly when you look at markup it links back to a correct characterization when i said earlier are you actually being remunerated at a aspect markup or not right this is where the benchmarking comes in to ensure that you're properly remunerated based on the markup itself and if you look at examples there right unlimited risks um service provider, for example, should then earn a fixed margin, right? Based on markup here, uh, it will be 5%. So you have to work backwards, uh, ensuring that, you know, at the end of the day, the Malaysia entity, when you close, before you close the books, we look at all the um, documents in place, working papers, journals, 
ensure it, ensure that all these are properly charged to your to entrepreneur. And at the end of the um, year, when you calculate and you prepare the books, for example, ensuring that the five percent um, is where the outcome is, right? So before you close the book, you have to make sure that you have earned five percent. If not, why? Perform maybe you have the adjustment to be made and to distinguish that um, to determine the five percent markup as well. Thank you, Hongjun. That's a really good point because a lot of the times companies ask us, okay, can I adjust some of the cost out in this scenario? And I think our answer is always like, as a default, no. You have okay. to look at it uh, cause by cause. So only in exceptional cases, you will be able to adjust, especially if it's a cost center who provides services to an entrepreneur. Let's see this uh, third scenario, which basically you have a situation of a dual head office situation, one ultimate head office in uh, France, one regional head office in Singapore, the same companies in Malaysia and Indonesia and paying management fees to both regional and ultimate company. So this is an actual case that happened to us. And the question is what, is the issue here and how, what challenges would you encounter from subsidiary point of view? Yeah, so scenario three, we, you know, we, we are looking at um, it from the example, you may, you may, it may seem that it's a, um, the same service. You're paying the same management fee to two companies. That's what the IRB will be looking at as well, right? So IRB will be looking at, hey, you're paying management fee to two head office. Are you paying the same thing? Are you paying for the same service, right? Maybe you're you're being overcharged again. So I need to look at the, the service provision, uh, service that you see, right? So these are challenges we have been facing, you know, from tax authorities where Malaysia is paying in Malaysia, Indonesia are paying management fee to two um head office. One is the regional head office. Another one is the ultimate parent, right? So the challenge is first thing. Uh, we shouldn't be um, terming it management fee, for example, right? We should then be reassess what are the services being provided by each holding company, right? When, I, when we're looking at non-chargeable, that's the first thing we need to look at to see whether we're actually paying for non-chargeable um, services or not, right? So reassess services being provided by France, reassess um, services by Singapore, to see whether actually these services are in fact non-duplicative. If they are duplicative, I think then you need to raise the question as to why you're paying, as an independent party, why am I paying two things at the same time, right? So these are the first thing that you need to look at. And we look at the services and would be great to actually term it accordingly, especially when um, company A and company B are actually provide invoicing to company C, for example, where if both invoices are termed management fee from two different entities that pose that highlights the risks of um, it being a duplicative service. And which means that first you need to look at whether they are duplic non-duplicative or not. If not, then a contract will should be put in place between company A and company B and company B and company C to ensure that Services provided by company A are properly documented in contract A. B, different type of service are actually um, provided to company C in two different contracts. And both and um, entailing what are the nature of the service and what are the cost base and the uh, markup as well to ensure that you, know, you, you do not have this duplicative issues in place where the tax authorities come in, hey, you're yes, duplicated. What are the reasons? And then on top of that, you have to ensure that you've gone through a benefit test. What does company A does to actually benefit you that is different from what company B provides to, to you, right? You have to clearly distinguish the benefits received from, from company A are more or less different from what I've received from company B to ensure that we address all these issues when the tax authorities come in. You know, always they'll, they'll come in. So we are the preempt. What are the questions that you ask? Thank you, Anchan. That's a really good point on especially the duplicative uh, aspect. So coming back to some of the, we just go 
through three cases that we have here, very simple cases on how these services are viewed from core point of view. And then the first one brings us back to the question that we asked at the beginning, which is, is there an avenue to just share cost? Is yeah. there an incentive for someone to mimic a situation or, or not someone from a taxpayer to mimic a situation where I share cost? Mm -hmm. And for that, I think this case study is very appropriate. Yeah. So do you want to go through it? Yeah, I'll go through the Malaysian one. I, I think yeah. it's exactly what you have mentioned earlier, whether we are sharing costs, this is actually what has happened with Shell, right? So at the end of the day, Shell actually had a cost contribution arrangement, cost sharing arrangement with a group of entities where the Malaysian entity is more or less a shared service provider, shared service company. And they have a um, CCA arrangement in, involved with the whole group and they are sharing costs, right? So what IRB has done is that they've really looked that all the transaction in place, all the activities performed, all the contributions, then what they've done is that re characterized this um, CCA into a service provision arrangement, whereby they think that this is not a CCA arrangement, this more, more so uh, Malaysia um, company as a service provider, providing service to the group itself and not actually sharing costs. Right, very, very key difference is cost contribution arrangement does not have any markup in place because you're sharing costs. There won't, no markup element. While a service arrangement will have a markup in post when you're being recharacterized. This is the scary part where when you're recharacterized, it has resulted in a tax payable of 15.6 million over a few years, right? So rule of thumb is, if you have to make sure that you know when you're, you're in a CCA, you want to make sure it's a CCA, not a service arrangement, right? So when you want to do a CCA, please perform a function analysis. As I mentioned earlier, your your functions, assets, and risks will need to be in line with um, what you are trying to um, achieve. If it's a cost contribution arrangement, um, there's a new rule. I'm not sure whether you're aware. The new TP rules in Malaysia has clearly identified what is the CCA. If you look at the schedule, schedule three, if I'm not mistaken, where there's clearly um, provided one of the documents in place for the CCA to happen. So rule of thumb is you have to, if you have a CCA, you have to follow the rules and re regulations whereby you, know, you have contribution, but at the same time, you have, being, you have benefits received as well for the particular cost contribution. So make sure that when you have one of the CCA, be it, make sure that it's a CCA involved. Yeah, so a CCA is actually the one avenue to not have markups in share in, in services, but it needs to be a true cost contribution agreement. I think that's why after this case, that's why we have that in, in Malaysia, the taxpayer needs to disclose whether a CCA is in place or not, because I wouldn't be surprised that if you do report a CCA, IRB will be coming and knocking on, on the door to double check that it is true a true CCA based on the fact that they already won one case to recharacterize the CCA. The second case um, is not in Malaysia, but it is in Indonesia where the tax authorities, I will say, behave somewhat similar, whereby we have a dispute of 6.35 million of service fee where Singapore as a head office was charging service fee to a, a company in Indonesia for what we always call management services, which is HR support, IT support, accounting, legal, and project finance. The service fee was set up as a total cost plus a markup of 7%. So the dispute was really about the fact that Indonesia tax authority was arguing not about the markup, not about the methodology, it was arguing basically that the service did not exist and that there was no economic benefit for the Indonesia entity over here. So what the taxpayer had to provide was a very thorough uh, documents around the benefits, such as the service agreement, 
the daily work reports from the service provider, evidence of travels, evidence of outputs on email, and obviously proper documentation to support the transaction. So we were talking earlier about remote support. I think remote support is very important to have evidence of both emails and outputs that one gives as a result of the support to be able to explain how the recipient of the service gets a benefit. These other case is very similar because it's again a situation of a company in India that receives services from a company in Singapore. And the approach is very much similar in the sense that the audit was about challenging the service charge as a whole and saying that the service didn't exist. And again, the Indian subsidiary having to have a proper documentation around the benefit, the allocation, how the arm's length price was set up, how it has benefited uh, the company economically as well, and what has been the output, what has been the time spent by the people in Singapore in providing the service and so on. So the, simi is this, the similarities between these two cases are there in the sense that first, tax authority does try to challenge the benefit because what it allows them to do is to deny the whole deduction on the service charge. Hence, why the taxpayer needs to be thorough when it comes to having the contracts, but also evidence on the outputs and the discussions that are uh, being done or being conducted between the teams. So I think with that, we can come to the end of our webinar, just for information, we have some key points here, which we have probably discussed extensively, um, but Honcho, I'm happy for you to just elaborate if you have anything in addition to this? Yeah, I think the main point is to follow our, our you know, the, the, the steps involved, benefit test, checking your cost base, um, your markup, having proper documents in place, work papers in place, right? And then provide your TPN, perform your TPN analysis. So this step, once you've gone through this, more or less you're covered in services. The main key point is to make sure that you have um, the evidence in place. That's where if you're in the event of audit, you really need to have this evidence, this working papers, this um, document in place to actually substantiate that service actually being provided and benefit was actually provided as well. Yeah, I think it comes back to good governance, to have contracts, proper descriptions, proper evidence of um, the outputs and the methodology to set up the price. So I think it, it, it I will define it in one word, which is good governance, mm -hmm. and to prove that you are not just setting up service charges out of the sky, that there is a proper methodology in place and good governance in place to address the issues associated with intergroup services. So with that, we can open to questions. Um, there is one question that I can see, but anyone else who has questions, happy to answer. So for a scenario T, what if the company B in fact is providing regional yes. services and charge the cost plus markup only to company A then company A charges the management fee to the group of services, the group of subsidiaries. So let me just go back to the example. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is basically that the regional Company B in fact provides regional services uh, only to company A. So in other words, the regional cost gets a uh, charge to company A and company A is the one that charges the consolidation as a whole. That's actually a good way of dealing with it. It's just that you're gonna have to explain really well that basically whatever is coming from company A is a combination of the cost pool of B and A, but that's actually, usually a good way of dealing with it so there is not multiple layers and then 
it is a bit troublesome because you need to make sure that you don't have multiple markups or markups being put into it. But it is uh, a good way which is consolidating all the cost, even if the if the cost is in different companies at regional and ultimate level in one place. Yeah, yeah. I think also just to highlight that it needs to be properly documented as well. Mm. Obviously, you're looking at Malaysia, but what if you are a company in France, for example? Obviously, the tax authorities in France be asking, hey, why are we seeing management fee from Singapore? Are we receiving any benefit uh, from this service from Singapore or not? Or mm -hmm. yeah, so these are these need to be uh, assessed and then properly then allocated. Yeah. That's a really good uh, point because it can create problems from the company who consolidates. So with that, we are at the end of our webinar. So for those of you who are new, please uh, follow us in our social media channels. We have a lot of content and a lot of uh, yeah content that we create in our YouTube channel. And we also do a lot in LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Google+, Link, so you name it. We are literally in every social media channel. We have been considering whether we do go to TikTok as uh, as well, but uh, we'll see about that. It's an interesting uh, social media channel as well, um, which will probably will come there soon, uh, as long as there is no more issues of being banned by someone else. We have some upcoming uh, webinars, so no more for for July. <laughs> which we did a lot of webinars in July. So we have 24th of August, profit splits versus traditional methods, 14th of September, top tips on transfer pricing, latest trends on intragroup loans. There is one missing here, which is at 30th of August, we will be talking about the new transfer pricing guidance in Malaysia in combination with Singapore. So stay tuned and uh, thank you everyone for attending today. And if you want to reach out to us, here is our details. Thank you. And thank Thanks. you. Thanks again. Thanks again.